Good morning to you. Happy Easter, everybody. Oh, that wasn't much. Happy Easter, everybody. Come on now. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Come on, give God a praise this morning. Good to see you guys this morning. You all look great. You know, it's, uh, it's Easter weekend. This happens every year. The masses will gather across America and other countries to celebrate a life, talk about his death, discuss a cross, a tomb, and much, much more. But what does that mean to you? How does that work for your life today? Because the truth is, if it means what we think it means, this should be a daily event, not a one-time-a-year event. Some of you guys are going... I gotta go to work Monday. I don't mean that way. I mean just realize that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I saw an Instagram post this week, and all good things happen on Instagram, right? So it said to the Christian, happy Easter, to the Jew, happy Passover, to the atheist, good luck. <laughs> and and I, I thought about the idea that even today in this house, there's uh, very diverse thinking on what Easter really means. And there's questions many of you may have about God and the Christian life and a guy dying on a cross and a tomb. And for some, it's really kind of awkward to think about it. And it really, there's some things that may not really add up in our natural mind. I totally get that today. But if you really begin to understand the why behind Easter, then you begin to understand the importance of this being part of your everyday life, not just a gathering of the masses on a calendar basis. And my goal today is to move all of us one step closer to a better walk with Jesus, no matter where you are, and maybe find you in a place in which you can draw closer to God because that's God's heart toward you today. And by no means am I, am I trying to criticize those who just come on the calendar. I'm so glad you're, we thank God you're here today. But I want you to know that there's much, much more to the Christian life that you may be missing out on. And my goal today is to share with you what Jesus really means so that you can begin to experience who he is and how he can change your life. And in fact, Easter is really a rescue story. It's a story of second chances. How many of you thank God for a second a shot in luck? Come on, you thank God for a second chance. I've yet to find somebody who doesn't thank God for a second chance in life. It's like a mulligan in the game of golf. Who's my golfers in the house? Who's my golfers out there today? Come on. You know, how many of you thank God for a mulligan every now and again? Some of you guys are going, what's a mulligan? Well, it's, a, it's an uncounted do-over that's actually cheating, by the way. Anyway, let's all move along. <laughs> See, God loved his creation so very, very much, he sent his son Jesus Christ to live and to die and to conquer sin and death in the grave. He did this on our behalf and in our place. The Bible, in essence, is really a series of books linked together talking about God's redemptive love and God's reckless love. This right here is a book of books that really all have the same theme, and that is this. God made his creation. God loved us so very much that when we were separated out by sin, God said, hey, we got to go get them and bring them back. In fact, you know, redemption did not begin on the cross. It's part of the story of the Scripture itself. In fact, from the beginning of time, God had a plan to redeem us back because he loved us so very much. Once you decide the Bible is the word of God and submit your life to this book, it will change everything. And hear me today. If you have questions, that's fine. I've been in church my entire life. I'm 44. I know I look much, much younger than that. I'm very deceiving today. What are you laughing about that for, Brenda? That's not very nice. But once you decide on the Word of God, there's questions I have. I don't know everything. The Christian life is not really a completion, but a journey. It's an ongoing process of discovery. It's learning more about God every day of your life. It's not just a purchase acquisition. It's a journey together with God, with his book, and with his people that draws you into a closer relationship to God. And I think about this, and I want to encourage you today, do not believe the Bible incrementally. Because this book either is or is not the Word of God. And it's either for all of us or for none of us, but never just for some of us. And today I would invite you in this house and watching online, I invite you to throw the Bible out if you choose to. I don't recommend that, but you can But the worst thing you can do is believe the parts you want to believe 
and throw out the rest of stuff because you cannot buffet the Bible. It either is, everybody say is, everybody say or is not. It's just that simple. Now, I believe it is the Word of God, and once you decide that this is the Word of God, it changed your entire life. In fact, in this book, we see the picture of God's redemptive plan. In fact, you can kind of go back a few hundred years before Christ to a time in which a guy named Jeroboam was on the throne. He was the king over Israel at that time. In Israel, the God's chosen people, they're prospering, they're doing so good, they're conquering, they're taking territories, the treasury's full of cash, and as is the case often in life, the better we do in the natural, the worse we do in the spiritual. Because as long as life is good, our need for God tends to kind of go down a little bit. And so Israel's doing so good, but, but with that came a significant moral and spiritual decline or even decay. And we find a new normal amongst God's chosen people. We find things like elevation of self, deception, killing, stealing, adultery, perversion, and much, much more. This was the new norm because sin has stepped in. Listen, evil always needs a carrier, and mankind have become the carrier of evil. So God comes on the scene and says, hey, I want to get you guys back. And he calls a prophet named Hosea. And this prophet's name is cool because the meaning of his name is simply this. It means Jehovah is salvation. And he gives this prophet an assignment that is very undesirable. He tells this prophet, listen to this, to go and marry a woman who was a harlot or a prostitute. And, re and marry her, redeem her back. Because God wanted to example to his people how they had wandered away from him as the true and only God and began to serve other gods. And we see this in Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. It says, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of the harlotry, for the land has committed a great harlotry against me by departing from the Lord. And then it says, so he went and took Gomer. Everybody say Gomer. Not the ideal bride name, is it? If, you, if you're about to have a daughter, I do not recommend the name Gomer. Hi, this is my baby. Here's Gomer. Ugh. I mean, if, if that's the name, folks can be staring at her for a long time like, what do we do with that? So it says, and, and he married her, and she conceived and bore him a son. So, so look at this picture real fast. This prophet of God is called by God. This guy named Hosea, Jehovah is salvation, is called by God to go and marry a prostitute. Because it's a picture of how we tend to wander from God to other lovers, other gods, give ourselves to them, and how God wants us to walk with him. But it's also a picture of this. When you think of God, always remember he is redemptive and that our repentance brings us back to a restored relationship. Because we cannot escape the undying love of God. And Hosea had a heart to see his wife restored back just like God wants his people who wander, W-A-N-D, wander off to other gods, other lovers, other affections, other things that take up our time, our resources, our heart's desires, and all of us are guilty of that. And then Hosea chapter 3 verse 1 says, The Lord said to me, go and love your wife again. Go find her. She's out there. She's walked away. She's ran away. Go find her. Love her again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, his people, even though the people have turned to serve other gods and love and worship them. What a story. Not, not your typical Easter weekend discussion, is it? But this is a great picture of God's reckless and redemptive love that he has for all of us. And the picture here has some tension because in this story is a very unthinkable person, a prostitute, and a husband who's lost his wife to other lovers, other gods out there. And then God's saying, go and find her, bring her back because that's my people. They love me while they want to and love somebody else when they choose to. And that's not what God wants from us today. Because God's so much better than we could ever imagine. God's so good today. God is loving. God is faithful. And I promise you this, if you give your heart to God today and live under the authority of this book, it will change your life forever for the better. I guarantee you that today. So I look at this story and there's a tension because you've got a polarizing character. 
You got a prophet who's like, how did I get this assignment? Can somebody else do this, please? Then you got God's people who tend to wander off. And then we see this picture that we are rescued for relationship and purchased back at a price. In Hosea chapter 14, toward the end of this book, it has a cool verse that says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Everybody say freely. That's an important word. Because God makes the choice to love us how? Freely. Not because you're good enough. Not because you're rich enough. Not because you do all the right things. None of us can ever go to God and say, hey, God, it's Marty, and today I qualify for your love. No, 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 not at all. None of us can do that. God's choice to love you is because he chooses to. And that's so cool because that's helpful because in my lifetime, that's the best kind of love ever, someone that chooses to love you. You know, a marriage works because they choose to love you. Parenting works because your kids choose to love you back as a parent. And when a person doesn't want to love, you can't make them love. You can't make a person be drawn to you. You can do your best. I know, I know many men out there, they think that your wife loves you because you're all that. And listen, the reality is her eyes are fading fast, and we thank God for that setting in. That's why she still loves you. Yeah, my wife loves me because of all this. Sir, you need to buy more mirrors for your house. You know, the Bible says in 1 John 4 that not that we love God, but that he loved us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Romans chapter 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And again, once you understand the why behind Easter, once you understand the why behind, behind this whole conversation, it will change your entire view. And make this more of a relationship than, a, than an event in your life. And my goal today, no matter where you are with God, no matter how close or how far away you are with God, I hope you'll leave here today one step closer to a restored relationship with a God who loves you recklessly. That's the goal today. See, God's nature is love. Love isn't what God does, it's who God is. It's an attribute, not an action. God doesn't act as love. God is love. And God cannot stop loving us because of his nature. And most of us are not familiar with this. Most of us, our first experience with love has with some rejection to it. Someone that you thought loved you who walked out on you. Someone who you thought cared for you that disappointed you. Maybe a parent, maybe maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe a best friend. All of us have faced that broken heart of love because of human's love is always broken because of our own nature. Think of it this way. Some of you are still in recovery from that junior high lunchroom breakup. And it was on pizza day. I promise you it was for the best. Grieve and go forward with life, Okay. I, I guarantee you're better off without him in your life. I guarantee you. But it was so bad. It was pizza day. It was a Thursday. And we broke up at lunch in junior high. And so for most of us, our love experience has to some, some brokenness, some difficulty, some cracks in the story. But that's not the love of God. And I think about this, and I just kind of look real fast at this picture of God's unfailing love, and that is God's always looking to love us. God's always longing for love. He's like the father in the prodigal son story. God cannot wait for the day that you come to your senses and go, I got to go back. And the day you decide, hey, this is the day, you'll not find a God who rejects you. You'll not find a God who goes, I told you so. You'll find a God that goes, come on, let's have a barbecue. I've been waiting for this. I love you. You're my creation. I fashioned you. I formed you. And I can't wait to have a party on your behalf because my son and my daughter who was lost has now been found. Let's go. Let's have a good old time because they're finally coming home. That's what you'll find. That's what you'll find. When you, when you look at this, we see the nature of love. Human love is conditional. Human love is based on exchanges. You scratch my back and I'll scratch, I'll scratch your back. You've heard that before, haven't you? You do for me, I'll do for you. And so we're used to exchange-based love. And then you think, well, what can I do for God? And the answer is 
Nothing. I mean, just other than give yourself, you can't buy God's love. You can't be good enough for God's love. Human love is based on things like consumption. How you make me feel about you, or about me. How I feel about you has a lot to do with how I feel about me. If you make me feel good about me, then I love you. That's a consumer love. We love things that love us back. But God loves people who reject him. God loves people who walk away. Because that's the nature of God love. It's unconditional. It's endless. It's perfect. It's covenant-based. It's truth-based. And it's always sacrificial. Because that's the nature of God's love. 1 John 4 eight says God is love. God's love is redemptive, God's love is reaching, God's love is relentless, and God's love is reckless. And here's why. Because God knows this about us. Even though he loves us, he knows. We have a thing called a sin nature. And he knows, before he loves us, that we're going to wander off in life because that's our nature. But yet he chooses to love us just the same. In human love, if you knew Someone will break your heart. If you knew on day one they're going to walk out, if you knew, you wouldn't go that route. But that's human love. Where God, in his knowing, he still chooses to love us because we are his creation. See, Jesus is really God's reckless love rescue attempt for us. A few hundred years after the prophet Hosea was on the scene, God looked at the sun in heaven and said, hey, I, gotta, I, I need you to go. I, I, I want you to go. And I want you to live among them. I want you to be there. I want you to be like them, experience what they experience. And then, son, I want you to give your life. I want you to die upon the cross. I want you to go through the difficulty of that horrific event on Calvary. I want you to take on all their sin. And then I want you to conquer death and hell and come back to life. Jesus, out of love for the Father, love for us, and submission, he did all those things. Jesus gets everything you're going through in this life. In fact, he understands you better than you. A lot of folks can get a stereotype of religious thought that says, you don't get my life. The Bible says to us in Hebrews 4, it says, For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize for our, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tested or tempted, yet without any sin. And that means no matter what you face today, Jesus gets it. They understand it. God gets your life. You can never look at God and say, you don't know what I've been through. And the truth is, in human levels, I don't always know what you've been through, what you face, where you've been in life. And that's true for this, but it's not true for this. I can never go to God and say, God, you don't get my story. I, this happened, that happened. That's not how it works. Let me encourage you today to just trust God long enough to assume he does know how you feel and let him begin to change your life and let your faith begin to grow and, 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 and answer your questions about God from inside the Word of God, inside the church, not on the outside looking in. All of us have questions. All of us have interests and curiosities. Like all of us do. But today maybe is the day you make a decision to go a different route and know that Jesus does get your life. See, like Hosea's wife, we're drawn to other things. And here's this broken person, this woman who's trying to find affirmation. She's got a really good husband, quality guy, man of God. And she finds herself wandering off. We often wonder, W-O-N-D, why people wander, W-A-N-D. We, wa we wonder why they wander. We've all seen somebody who seemingly had it all together who took off with somebody else. You're thinking, what were they thinking? That's the sin nature. That's the nature within that destroys ourselves. And today, maybe you can take a different path because there's a real thing called sin. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The one thing in common in this room today and those watching online, the one thing in common for all of us is all of us have a sin nature. None of us come to God because we're good enough or because we're holy enough, but because we need a Savior. That's how we all come to God. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. All of us stand equally before the cross of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. No matter how long you've been saved, whether you've been a believer for five minutes or never a believer. Whether you've been a believer for 50 years, you still stand before God as a person in need of a Savior every day of your life. So I look at this word sin, 
uncomfortable word, isn't it? No one likes to talk about sin. But it's real. In fact, every difficulty we face in life is because of sin. Your sin or somebody else's. I always tell, I tell marriage couples when they first get married, I say there's, there's three things that will kill a marriage. Uh, sinfulness, selfishness, and just pure stupidity. Uh, avoid those three and you'll be pretty fine. I, I, you'll, you'll do okay. Uh, sinfulness, selfishness, and what? Stupidity. Just don't be those three things. But all of us have a sin nature. In fact, our society looks at sin this way. Society wants to legislate laws to stop sin. We've watched in the recent weeks and months some horrific events take place in our communities, in our churches, in our schoolhouses, our marketplaces, in which we see the outcome of sin. Remember, evil needs a carrier. Evil needs someone to flow through. Mankind has become that carrier. And our society is convinced if we can pass more laws, we'll stop evil. Listen to me. God gave us laws that rid us of evil. We don't obey those. And man's laws can only punish a crime. God's laws prevent the crime. Because you govern from the inside and from the heart, you choose not to do it. And now it's not about the consequence, but about the fact you didn't choose to make that choice in life. As a parent, I can only punish my kids for what they do. But when my kid gets a heart that's right, they choose not to do those things. That's the same for us today. See, you can't deal with societal brokenness and sinfulness by passing laws because it's a spiritual issue, not a social one. You've got to get to the heart of the spirit. The only way to rid ourselves of sin is from a spiritual perspective, never a social one. You can't pass enough laws to get rid of sin. You've got to change the heart of the sinner, and that's how you rid yourself of sin. for living. That's how you do it. Psalm 119 says, your word I've put in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh God, this book right here changes how you make choices in life and impacts your living every day. And because of this book, we can choose to not make that sinful choice. Sin is a negative term. What about this word? What about the word grace? How many thank God today for grace in your life? You thank God for grace today? Man, I thank God for grace. I love grace because it's an important part of living. But you've got to realize the state we're in. Sin is real. Sin is deceptive, offering you something in the moment only. Sin is by nature disguised. You can get by with sin for a long time. But listen to me. The longer you cheat the knowing of others around you, the worse the uncovery will be. The longer you get by, the worse the consequence will be. Listen, you can cheat me, you can cheat life, you can disguise it from lots of folks, but you can't hide it from God. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. So sin by nature is destructive, it has delayed consequence that comes, no, there's a guarantee it'll happen to you. But I thank God today for grace. Every one of us are here because of God's grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, for grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And not of your own works, your own doings, lest you should boast. It's not about me. It's about a free gift God's given to me called grace. To fully understand grace, we have to recognize where we would be without Jesus Christ and who we become because of Christ. See, we're born into a sin nature, guilty of breaking God's laws, all of us in this case. We're actually born enemies of God, unholy, unworthy. And we are born in this earth, on this world, with our souls in peril of everlasting punishment. That's a tough one to think about, isn't it? Did he just say everlasting punishment? That's hard to process, isn't it? You know why? Nowadays, we don't punish folks for anything. How many in this house today, you were raised by parents who, when you did something wrong, you got your backside pounded? Can I get a hand up real fast? Yeah, and you survived and lived, and you, you made it through. How many of this house that your parents wouldn't care if the neighbor gave you a spanking? Come on, I put your hand up high. They lined the whole street up. Everybody come out. We're going to spank Johnny. Come on, let's go. Everybody get out here. How many in the house today, when you, when, when you were in school, if you got in trouble at school and got a swat, you got a pat on the back at the house, too. Put your hand up. You got two for one. It's two for one Friday. And your parents will write the teacher a thank you note. Thank you for helping us. We need help with this kid. Not nowadays. The school can't do nothing. The government can't do nothing. 
We don't punish anybody anymore because in our heart of hearts, we have a hard time with this idea. But you know what? There's a real thing called divine judgment. And, and you don't have to believe it to make it true. It's true. In fact, if you think about it, life itself is full of all kinds of judging points. For example, the bathroom scale is judgment. Can I get an amen? You climb up on that scale and it goes, you hear this phrase, what you all been doing up there? You know, it's like, one at a time, please. Oh, sorry. The credit card bill, judgment. Man, you were spending and swiping, cha-ching, bada-bing, having the best time of your life. And then the mail had to up and run. And bring you the thing called the bill, and now you got to pay the piper. But it was so much fun that the bill came in. It's judgment. What about the scoreboard at a, at a ball game where this is, the, this is the final four weekend, lots of college hoops, uh, craziness going on. It's a great time to get together and watch games, certainly. But last night, there was two games. Each game had a winner and a loser. A judgment. Based on the performance of the game, here's the outcome. So it's just reasonable to think about this. Life is full of various points of judgment. Is it any less real at the end of this life? Will you be able to escape a holy God and say, Hey, uh, you know, I, I don't qualify for this thing. I'm, I'm okay by myself. See, in life, there's really no such thing as a judgment-free zone, just delayed verdicts. And you might not get judged today, but it will happen at some point in life. Uh, I, th I think of it this way. When this life ends, we will each stand before God. And here's the reality. It's very tough to teach this sermon in the Bible Belt. I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible Belt is full of folks who think because where they're born, they're going to heaven. And that is not the case. Each one of us stand before a holy God as individuals. My dad's a pastor, retired now. I grew up in the preacher's house. I was in church my entire life. I still had to walk an aisle, walk, walk an aisle and go to an altar and confess my sin and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I could not go to heaven and say, but God, my dad's a preacher, man. You know, I, I was raised in this stuff, been around church my entire life. God, I went to church. It doesn't work that way. It's about you before a holy God. Him looking at your life. And each of us will face this thing. You say, Marty, what, what really is grace? Well, grace, i got a short definition for you. It's a big word, but here's just a small definition. Grace is God's favor toward the unworthy. In his grace, God is willing to forgive us in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be treated so well or dealt with so generously. And that's what makes grace so amazing. I thank God today for a thing called grace.